Right now on Morning News Now, new developments in the Israel-Hamas war. This morning, for the first time since it began, limited evacuations from Gaza to Egypt have begun through the Rafah border crossing. It's happening as rescuers frantically search for survivors after a Gaza refugee camp was hit in an airstrike that Israel says killed a high-ranking Hamas leader. Plus, taking the stand, the sons of former President Donald Trump are in the spotlight this week as they testify in the civil fraud trial here in New York. We'll have analysis on what we can expect to hear from their testimony. Also this hour, firefighters in Southern California are battling a raging wildfire that's forced thousands from their homes. We'll bring you the latest. And Halloween may be over, but we want to show you one more creative costume. One family is continuing their tradition of creating wheelchair-inclusive costumes for their son. And this year, it caught the attention of his favorite hockey player. We'll show you that sweet surprise. Oh, uh, looking forward to bringing you that story as we now start the holiday season, right? Basically, yes. Oh, it is. It's Christmas Mar time. Mar Mariah, Mariah has said declared so. it. <laughs> right, there you go. Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks for joining. We begin our show with new developments out of Gaza this morning. Some people are being allowed to leave the devastated Palestinian enclave for the first time since October 7th. Earlier today, the Rafah border crossing between Gaza and Egypt was opened for a limited evacuation of foreign and dual nationals. Ambulances were also seen entering Gaza to evacuate a small number of injured Palestinians to Egypt for treatment as Israel continues its aerial and ground assault. Yesterday, humanitarian groups condemned Israel for bombing the Jabalia refugee refugee camp in Gaza, killing dozens of Palestinians. The IDF says it killed a Hamas commander in the attack. Here at home on Capitol Hill, anti-war protesters disrupted a congressional hearing where Secretary of State Antony Blinken was testifying, calling for more funding for Israel. The protesters were escorted from the room after shouting for a ceasefire in Gaza, while others raised red stained hands. We start with NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Kobiea, who joins us from Tel Aviv. So Kelly, let's start with the off a border crossing, it appears to finally be open. Walk us through the details and conditions of this limited evacuation, how to come about, and just how many people are being allowed to leave. Yeah, Joe Cutter, once again, central to uh, getting this deal done. We understand that the negotiators in Qatar were able to uh, mediate a deal between Israel, Hamas, and Egypt uh, with the U.S.'s involvement in order to get the Rafah border crossing opened. Of course, this is something that we've been talking about now almost since the start of the war. Uh, we The details, though, are still a little bit um, murky. We understand that this will be a deal to allow some of the most critically injured to be evacuated from Gaza. We don't have an exact number. The number of 80, uh, dozens of people has been uh, talked about, but no confirmation on that. We do know that some of these ambulances have now been seen entering that crossing. And in terms of the people coming out, uh, a, critical, a crucial piece of this deal, uh, there are some 500 uh, U.S. passport holders trapped inside Gaza according to the Secretary of State. Uh, we don't have an exact number of how many people will be allowed out. It could be hundreds. It could be less than that. You know, we've talked several times over the past few weeks about this border crossing potentially opening for a short period of time. The State Department has urged people, Americans, who want to get out to move south to stay in the region of that border crossing. Now, finally, uh, after, I think, 26 days, 25 days, we're at the point where that crossing is potentially opening. We're seeing people move into it. It's a multi-stage process to get through a crossing like this, so it could take quite a while uh, for the first people, the foreign passport holders who are going to be allowed out to get all the way through that crossing and to the Egyptian side. Joe, Savannah. And Kelly, this is all happening as Israel continues to bomb Gaza from the skies, and yesterday they targeted the Jabalia refugee camp. What are we learning about this attack and what's been the broader reaction here? Yeah, Israel said this was a large-scale attack. The IDF not at all uh, denying it. They said that they did, in fact, carry out an attack on this refugee camp. It's not what you would normally picture in terms of a refugee camp. This is a place with dozens of apartment buildings. Uh, the IDF said they were targeting a top Hamas commander and that they also were able to collapse a subterranean command center and kill a number of Hamas militants as well. And they blame 
blamed Hamas for using civilians as human shields. Now, Hamas has denied that this commander, his name is Ibrahim Biari, was actually at the camp. They accuse Israel of, of destroying some 20 homes. Uh, you can see just the devastating, devastating pictures. What is clear is that people were killed. Uh, there were images of children being carried out of that uh, of that rubble, uh, just horrible images of families looking for their loved ones. And it has generated yet more uh, anger and outrage internationally. Qatar and Jordan were quick to condemn that strike. Bolivia breaking diplomatic ties with Israel today. Chile and Colombia recalling their ambassadors. So the ramifications of what happened there uh, are are going to continue to unfold throughout today as we see more of these images of civilians uh, trying to find their their family members. Joe Kelly, in, in addition to the aerial assault, we know Israel has now been fighting on the ground. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu gave an update on that earlier this morning. What did he say? Yes, so he released a statement. His office released a video statement after it was announced by the IDF that several soldiers have been killed in this uh, in this fighting on the ground. About 12 soldiers, we understand from local media, have now been killed uh, in in ground uh, fighting. Uh, the Prime Minister saying that we know that each of our soldiers is a whole world, essentially offering the state's condolences, his condolences to these soldiers, saying that the entire nation of Israel embraces you from the bottom of our hearts. We are all with you in your time of great sorrow. But he also said that told the nation we're in a difficult war. It will be a long war. We have important in achievements in it, but also painful losses and promising that Israel will be victorious. But, you know, when you look at uh, the names published in local media today of those soldiers, we're talking about soldiers. Uh, the, the oldest is 24. Most are 20 or 19 years old, guys. All right. Kelly Cobie, reporting from Tel Aviv. Kelly, thank you so much. Thank you. Let's now bring in the Jerusalem Post editor-in-chief, Avi Mayer, for more on this. Thank you very much for joining us again. So if you could give us an idea of how Israeli are feeling watching this war unfold at this point and, and what's happening in Gaza, like what they make of this attack on a refugee camp and the larger invasion. Is this what people were expecting? Well, you know, Israel is a country that has been in perpetual mourning seemingly for the past four weeks, first for the victims of the Hamas massacre on October the 7th, um, and now for those 12 soldiers who fell in battle over the past 24 hours in Jabalia in the northern Gaza Strip. So I think this is pretty much exactly what we were anticipating when uh, the prime minister said that this is a war that Hamas launched. We didn't want this war. We weren't looking for it. Um, but we now need to defend ourselves and ensure that Hamas never has the capacity to carry out a massacre like October the 7th ever again. So Yes, it's painful. And of course, as was mentioned, this is something that is likely to not be done in the next few days, but rather could perhaps be a longer term campaign. Um, but it's something the Israeli people are prepared for in order to ensure that their sons and daughters can go to sleep at night in peace. Uh, Avi, we know some Israelis are calling on Prime Minister Netanyahu to stop attacking, attacking Gaza until the roughly 240 hostages are released from Hamas. Is there a feeling that the hostages have been forgotten at all by the government? I mean, how optimistic are people that they can still be rescued? Well, we know that one Israeli soldier was indeed rescued um, two nights ago. That was, of course, a cause for great celebration in Israel. Um, the prime minister has related to those concerns, saying that he feels that applying pressure on Hamas in the form of this campaign um, will encourage them to loosen their demands and, in fact, release those 240 hostages. But of course, the Israeli public is very concerned, of course, as are the families, to ensure that they aren't got in any way affected negatively by this campaign. Um, you know, Hamas had originally threatened to execute hostages if Israel continued its uh, ground assault or its aerial uh, campaign. We don't know whether that's happened. We don't know very much at all. They've been very cagey. They've been uh, keeping that information close to their chests, of course, in contravention of international law. Um, they haven't given access to the Red Cross or any other humanitarian organizations to those hostages. So there is a great deal of anxiety in Israel, particularly amongst those families, about the fate of those hostages. 
Avi, is there any concern in Israel just perception-wise that international support wanes or changes just as we see what unfolds in Gaza? Keeping in mind, of course, what you said about how Israel did not want this war, but just seeing what's unfolding now, is there a concern just that the perception of that creates damage to support? You know, I think it was Golda Meir who said that uh, if Israel has a choice between being killed and pitied and defending itself and and sub being subject to international criticism, it'll choose to defend itself and be subject to that criticism. I think that's how many Israelis feel right now. Certainly no Israeli wants to see innocent people affected by this, as is happening in Gaza as a result of Hamas's cynical practice of embedding itself and operating from within civilian areas in the Gaza Strip. But at the same time, any country has not only the right, but in fact, the responsibility to defend itself and ensure that its citizens aren't subject to horrific attacks like October the 7th. So I think that that's pretty much a consensus in Israel, that Israel needs to do whatever it can to ensure that Hamas never has the capacity to carry out a massacre like that ever again. Jerusalem Post, Avi Mayer, thank you for continuing to join us throughout this so we can hear the latest from there in Israel. We appreciate your time. Thank the you. FBI is warning of a growing terrorist threat here in the U.S. Officials are worried potential attackers might be inspired by Hamas following last month's attack on Israel. NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haake has more on that. Stand and on Capitol Hill, a stark warning about the growing threat at home from the devastating war abroad. The ongoing war in the Middle East has raised the threat of an attack against Americans in the United States to a whole nother level. FBI Director Chris Wray signaling the U.S. is in a dangerous period. We assess that the actions of Hamas and its allies will serve as an inspiration, the likes of which we haven't seen since ISIS. As Jewish college students are facing threats on U.S. campuses, Cornell University officials confirming the arrest of a suspect in connection with online threats of a mass shooting and other violence there. To see, you know, my own campus targeting specifically 104 West, this building, the building that I live in, sleep in, it was just unbelievable. A Las Vegas man also charged with threatening to kill Nevada Senator Jackie Rosen, who is Jewish, after leaving a series of anti-Semitic, profanity-laced voicemails. 3,500 kids dead. Also on the Hill, anti-war protesters interrupting a hearing as the secretaries of state and defense were pushing the White House plan to spend $105 billion in emergency support for Israel, Ukraine, and other national security threats. That funding dividing House and Senate Republicans. New Speaker Mike Johnson setting a vote this week on aid to Israel alone, with $14 billion in military and humanitarian assistance, while some GOP senators argue to include aid to Ukraine. To separate the package is, is naive because the threats are in, have commonality. Ray went on to say that the Bureau is not tracking any specific imminent threat from a foreign terrorist group and that his biggest concern would be a lone extremist inspired by the events happening overseas. He urged every American to remain vigilant. Garrett Hake, thank you so much. Let's bring in Jim Cavanaugh for more. He's an NBC News terrorism analyst and a former ATF special agent in charge. Jim, good morning. So let's talk about the concerns laid out by FBI Director Ray. How are government agencies prepared to prevent attacks against the U.S.? Is a lone wolf attack by someone who's inspired by Hamas the greatest threat? Right, Joe. Well, that is that is a tough threat sometimes because you need awareness of uh, our specific intelligence to stop, you know, a lone mad dog attacker. Uh, but the first step is the awareness. And Director Ray has given us uh, a real read between the lines of what U.S. intelligence and U.S. law enforcement has on their plate right now. He's telling us uh, in general without telling us all the specifics. So it's it, the first step's awareness, and he's providing that to the Congress and the American people that we are in a very, very heightened state now, and we've got to be very vigilant. Yeah, I want to ask about being very vigilant because he did sort of also put it on individuals, as Garrett just mentioned there at the end, each American remaining vigilant. What should we remember as individuals, but also tell us about lessons the U.S. has learned from combating terrorism, like mentioning that we haven't seen a threat like this since ISIS. What have we learned and what should people keep in mind? Well, right, Savannah, great uh, uh, question, because remember that al-Qaeda and ISIS still exist. 
And, and so does Nazi ideology still exist, even in our domestic neo-Nazi groups and Klan groups. So these ideologies do exist. Al-Qaeda specifically has called to inspire sleeper cells to attack in the U.S. They want people in the U.S. to rise up and attack America because of the conflict in Israel and Gaza. Uh, ISIS as well is not completely uh, uh, gone. They have also called for attacks against Jews in U Europe and the U.S. So these groups calling for these attacks can inspire these uh, mad dog actors to rise up. You know, that's what we saw in years past when the uh, actor wasn't really connected to the group as a you know, sworn in, made member by bin Laden, but yet is inspired over the internet to act on a larger issue in the world. And when those groups are seen as strong by people in the U.S. who have a like-minded hate ideology, uh, their actions are driven by the internal hate. And when they get the call to arms and they see these groups having what they see as success, even though it's basically just vulgar violence on civilians, they see that as success. They want to be a part of that, and they step up and act. Yeah. Another worry is something that we're already seeing, hate crimes. Mm -hmm. They were already on the rise before the war in Gaza began, but the FBI warned the Jewish community is especially yeah. at risk. Hate crimes against Palestinians have also gone up. How do federal agencies handle these types of threats, especially right now with everything intensifying so much? Well, Joe, you know, we routinely met with uh, Jewish leaders at synagogues. Uh, we met with Muslim leaders at mosques. I've had uh, arrested Nazis trying to bomb, uh, you know, uh, temples and synagogues and, you know, investigated uh, fire bombings and bombings on uh, uh, Muslim mosques uh, and Christian churches, too. I mean, we've had, we've had attacks on all religious groups. Um, I've worked many of those and worked with those leaders. Uh, People get this uh, poisoned by hate. It gets in their mind. And when they see a broad spectrum, Joe, of other people saying those same things, you know, painting uh, anti-Semitic messages on, on uh, buildings, uh, they feel connected to that. They feel like, oh, I'm not alone. I, I don't hate alone. I hate what all these other people around the world. Look what they're doing. They're standing up for hate. So it's the hate that drives it. And uh, it's just so broad right now. You, you, and of course, Director Ray talking about the Jewish people. I mean, I worked extensively with the Anti-Defamation League over the years, and they're extremely good. They stood up for everybody, not the, just the Jewish people. They stood up for hate against Muslims and Hindus and Christians and everyone. They're a great organization, and they work against all hate. So they would help us, you know, to identify people who they would tar watch that were, you know, spouting this stuff out. So uh, it, it is a leitmotif of hate, but it's a very violent period in the world. Uh, we can't we can't get out of that. I mean, this is going to drag on in the Middle East. You got mm -hmm. nations pouring in: Hezbollah, Hamas, Iran's overlaying it. Uh, Sunni and Shia violence. We got the Nazi domestic threat here, and old clan members and local bigots. It's not going away. Law enforcement has to mm -hmm. really be on their toes and follow through on every lead. Every time a citizen calls. Don't do what happened in Lewiston, Maine, where they had all this information. The guy was going to shoot up a place, and they didn't act appropriately. You've got to follow up. You can't let the ball drop. Mm, You've got to right. move on it. All right, Jim Cavanaugh, thank you so much, as always. We appreciate your analysis. Mm -hmm. Well, both Jews and Palestinians call the Twin Cities in Minnesota home, and they're following the war very closely. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez spent the day getting their views on the war. More than 6,000 miles from Israel, the war hits home. So my initial response was fear and sadness mm -hmm. and anger. A seat at the table, it's both Jewish. Just living a nightmare, like a horror story. Palestinian, we are Semitic people. And Palestinian. Jeff Burstein's grandfather opened his family's first Jewish restaurant in the 1930s. He now checks the latest news from Israel hourly and was horrified when he first learned of Hamas's terrorist attack on October 7th. Were you surprised? No. Why not? Because they've been telling for years that they want to destroy not only Israel, but Jews. And people that speak that way, you have to believe what they tell you. Over lunch, we listened in as three Jewish Americans opened up about their agony over the war. 
and my extended Jewish family is being threatened here yeah. on a daily basis and across the world, and it's terrifying and infuriating. I feel like I, I just keep going back to the word home, and it's not home like a home that's thousands of, thousands of miles away. It's home that is like right here. I think there's a way to have discourse that isn't hateful. There's exactly. a way to have a protest that doesn't say yes. kill the Jews. And as for the humanitarian concerns in Gaza. I'm getting very emotional because I really wish there was a way to, you know, be able to still feed people, but have it not also feed the enemy who came in and slaughtered thousands of our own people. Nearby Mims Cafe opened decades ago. Palestinian-American owner Mahmoud Shaheen's wife and five of his children live in the occupied West Bank. When you see the images coming out of Gaza, of all those casualties, what it goes through your head? You know, it is horrifying. It is definitely horrifying. We also listened in as Palestinian Americans at his restaurant spoke about the war from a much different perspective. It does seem clear that Israel is, is geared towards vengeance, not necessarily getting the leadership of Hamas by itself. Until there's an end to Israeli occupation and aggression, there will be no peace. They're furious at the U.S. government for not supporting a ceasefire. I am honestly not voting uh, Democrat again. Um, I'm not going to vote for Biden. But for them, this is about much more, what they consider a long history of being dehumanized. This idea that we have to constantly earn empathy, it's ridiculous. We're auditioning for sympathy. It's outrageous. Two tables, two very different viewpoints, a world apart. Gabe Gutierrez, NBC News, Minneapolis. Well, it's a big day today in former President Donald Trump's civil fraud trial taking place in lower Manhattan. His sons, who are both defendants, are scheduled to take the stand. This is part of the case brought by New York State Attorney General Letitia James at issue, whether the Trump Organization falsely inflated the value of company assets. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos, of course, joins us with more on this. Danny, great to see you. So we're going to see Don Jr. To, set to take the stand today first. Eric Trump following him. Don is expected to be grilled about his alleged knowledge, involvement, of these inflated uh, financial statements, that that's what's at issue here. The attorney general's office says they were grossly inflated, in fact. What can we expect to hear on the stand today? What are you looking for? I've heard a lot of folks suggest that the Trump family might take the Fifth Amendment. They may decline to answer questions at Trump's civil trial. Uh, that may be true, mm. but what I think is more likely is a little more of what we've seen in depositions and discovery so far. I think they're going to come back right at the attorney general and the cross-examiner or excuse me, the person questioning them on the stand, uh, and argue really two central themes. Number one, when it comes to valuation of property, who are you, attorney general, to say what the values of these properties are, especially when you add to it uh, the Trump brand, which I'm sure they will try to make the point is something that adds a lot of value to a building. It's something that may even be incalculable mm. in their mind. And look for them to try and be the smartest real estate person in the room, smarter than the AG's office questioning them. So I think that's going to be a central theme. The other theme you're going to see is the, yes, I may have been the boss, but that doesn't mean I knew everything that was going on. Right. We were busy. We're the Trumps. We're running around. We're opening hotels. We're not sitting down and looking at the debits and credits and the line items. That's for the accountants. That's for the other people. So if some of this slipped under the radar, that's not really my thing. I do all the high-profile stuff. So look for those two central themes uh, for all the Trump children. Also quickly, right, on the children, Ivanka, the... Former president's daughter, of course, dropped from the lawsuit, but is still slated to take the stand next week. Anything different there with her? She's still uh, going to likely appeal, even being served. And the argument they have is twofold. It's that she's neither a party, nor is she in New York any longer. And the AG's office argument as well, she may not be traditionally subject to what we call personal jurisdiction. But number one, she's so involved in New York. And number two, mm. she works or it benefits from a corporation here, is associated with it. And that corporation, the attorney general, has jurisdiction over. So uh, not 100 percent mm. sure she'll testify but all likelihood she will. Trump himself scheduled to take the stand next week. I mean, we know what he thinks, whether it's on social media or whether he stands outside that courthouse and proclaims his feelings to the media. What can we expect with this 
pros and cons for Trump? Again, yeah, I don't expect him to take the Fifth Amendment. I don't expect him to decline to testify on the grounds that may incriminate him. In New York, in civil cases, the assertion of the Fifth Amendment can result in a what's called a negative inference. In other words, uh, theoretically, the judge or a jury could say, hey, whatever he didn't talk about, I can kind of assume whatever it was was going to be really bad for him. But I think you're going to see a similar theme among all Trump family members, which is Look, New York Attorney General, you don't know anything about real estate. We do. And the valuations we put on our properties, hey, they may be a little higher than you think they are, but it's real estate. Real estate's worth whatever someone will pay for it. And when it comes to the former president, how do you think the gag order and then issues and fines, like the $15,000 one related to the gag order, play into what we might hear next week? Is that in any way put him on thin ice, or you think we won't really see any behavior change? Trump is theoretically on thin ice with a gag order. And I say that because I mean that if this were any regular defendant, civil or criminal that you've never heard of before, they would probably already be facing incarceration for violation of gag orders mm -hmm. and the things that Trump has been saying. But Trump is no ordinary defendant. So that's why I often say, whether it's a prosecutor or a judge who says, look, this is someone who'll be treated the same as anybody else, horse feathers. Donald Trump <laughs> is being treated differently than everybody else in the sense that, first of all, you probably can never incarcerate him for violation for sanctions, for violation of a gag order. How are you going to do that? You can try. Believe me, no judge, they may not say this publicly, Every judge wishes that Trump would just stop talking because they don't want to have to deal with the possibility of having to incarcerate him for violation of a gag order because the administrative nightmare that would result mm -hmm. would be unprecedented, obviously, because he's a former president and he's flanked by Secret Service members. Uh, Donald Trump is essentially daring them uh, to hold him in contempt and send him to jail, which courts can do. But with this defendant, civil or criminal, they do not want to mm -hmm. do that. Even or in... I was going to say, Horse Feathers is the name of a restaurant I just saw in Terrytown, oh. actually. So. And I was just going to say, even in the appropriate blazer, you still find a way to make me laugh, Danny Savalas. Thank you very much. The Biden administration is proposing a new plan to forgive federal student loan debt. The plan would target four categories of borrowers who have various circumstances that are hampering their ability to repay student loans. That includes borrowers with balances that currently exceed the original amount borrowed, also those with loans that entered into repayment 25 years ago <clears throat> or more. Month Monthly payments resumed in October for the first time since March of 2020. That was the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Earlier this year, the Supreme Court rejected President Biden's plan to forgive up to $20,000 for borrowers. Let's get you some weather for millions of Americans. It may be time to break those winter jackets <laughs> out. Let's get a closer look at this morning's chilly temps. Yeah, meteorologist Angie Lastman's here with the forecast. Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Now I'm trying to figure out how I can work horse feathers horse into feathers. my forecast. Uh, how about um, goose feathers for that down coat? <laughs> That's what you need <laughs> because done. it's chilly. Oh, they like that. <laughs> <laughs> it is frigid out there in a lot of spots. We've got that really cold air swooping down from Canada, and, it, and you can feel it. For more than 170 million people this morning, you're waking up to low at or below freezing. That includes a lot of major cities, Chicago, Burlington, Nashville, Dallas, out towards the west as well, including places like Jackson. So the extra layers are a must. We've got millions of people under these frost and freeze alerts this morning, mainly focused towards portions of the southeastern United States, but still up and down really the entire eastern half of the country. You can see temperatures into the 20s and into the 30s. Right now, Sioux Falls is at 26 degrees, but feeling like 15. Chicago, 30 degrees, but feeling like 25. We've got places like Lexington into the 20s. Wind chill in Atlanta is at coming in at 27 degrees. So it is a chilly morning for sure. It doesn't get a lot better by later this afternoon, but we will warm up just a touch. We'll eventually end up back into the low 60s for folks in the southern tier of this of this region. Low 60s for Houston, New Orleans, Tallahassee. More of the 50s is expected for places like Philadelphia, Knoxville, and Little Rock. But the 40s in Cleveland, you're barely going to get into the 40s too. 41 degrees. That's your high this afternoon. As we get into tomorrow, you'll start to see an indication of a little bit of a warm up. And tomorrow's kind of our transition day. We'll still be into the 40s, 50s, and 60s for that region. But eventually, as we get into the weekend, more typical kind of temperatures for early November will take shape. Uh, New York will go from the upper 50s on Friday to the low 60s for both Saturday and Sunday. So nicer conditions are expected. Uh, as we look ahead, though, to the next couple of days in the Pacific Northwest, soggy conditions. We'll see another atmospheric river leaving us with the the potential for some heavy downpours and the flood risk will be there along with some winds and not to mention some snow as we get into uh, tomorrow for portions of the northern Rockies. So winter is just coming Ooh. in full force, huh? Yeah. Makes, me wanna, makes me want to sleep, in which case you'll need down feathers. Oh, 
Do you have one? No. no. <laughs> we added feathers. You can't we used you find a horse feather feather tower or something? <laughs> yeah. What is a horse feather? I don't know. <laughs> I think that was the point. It's a bunch of baloney, okay. basically. Hashtag horse feathers. <laughs> Angie, thank you very much. We are back with details about a massive wildfire in Riverside County, California. Hundreds of firefighters working around the clock to battle the rapidly growing blaze that's forced thousands of residents to evacuate. NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz has their story. In Southern California, a desperate race to contain a wildfire exploding out of control. If you received an evacuation order, please leave. 4,000 Riverside County residents ordered to flee their homes as crews battle the Highland Fire. It is totally blowing. The wind is blowing horrendously. Officials say it doubled in size, jumping across a major highway and burning more than 2,200 acres northeast of San Diego. Residents in the small town of Aguanga capturing the flames encroaching the roads around them. These smoky conditions making it nearly impossible to see. Some say they only had minutes to escape. I don't think not even uh, 20 minutes, half an hour. Luis Quinones, who has lived in Riverside County for 33 years, returning to his property, finding his son's home, his firewood business, and 12 of his prized cars completely destroyed. No more. No more, baby. The blaze, which started Monday afternoon and spread quickly, fueled by dry and gusty Santa Ana winds, still 0% contained. What has been the biggest challenge with fighting this fire? The first is the terrain that the fire is burning in is extremely steep and rocky. Um, it's steep with valleys and gulches. The second challenge is that we have um, high winds. We're in the Santa Ana wind pattern right now. Yesterday, they had sustained winds between um, 20 to 30 miles an hour on the incident um, with gusts up to 40. Cal Fire using all their resources to fight these flames. We do have um, about 400 firefighters on the ground that are pulling hose line, um, cutting line. We do have water dropping helicopters and tankers dropping retardant uh, when the wind is allowing it. Across California, many parts of the state seeing red flag warning conditions, meaning low humidity and strong winds that help fuel the flames. On Monday, firefighters responded to several small brush fires, two on the central coast, prompting evacuations near San Luis Obispo High School. We were getting a lot of ashes and there's a lot of spot fires coming up in our yard that we put out. And uh, it, it only got a little worrisome when those eucalyptus trees start exploding around us. Our thanks to Liz Kreutz for that story. Well, windy conditions are forecast through tomorrow, which are expected to fuel this growing fire. Now to international headlines. Bolivia has severed diplomatic ties with Israel as ongoing tensions in the Middle East escalate. Yes, yeah, we mentioned earlier in our program, NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga has details on that and other news from around the world. Claudio, good morning. Good morning, guys. Well, that's right. On Tuesday, Bolivia broke diplomatic relations with Israel after it accused it of crimes against humanity in Gaza. Now, at a news conference, the foreign minister of Bolivia explained that the decision to sever diplomatic relations was made, quote, in repudiation and condemnation of the aggressive and disproportionate Israeli military offensive in Gaza. For the same reason, Chile and Colombia recalled their ambassadors to Israel. Colombia's president wrote on social media, if Israel doesn't stop the massacre of Palestinian people, we cannot remain there. None of the three countries mentioned the attack by Hamas on October 7th. Let's go to Australia now, where a wildfire has been raging for more than a week, killing at least one person and destroying more than 50 homes. Firefighters have battled the wildfire in the Queensland state town of Tara for days, with local authorities warning it's a fire that can't be extinguished but needs to be controlled. There were about 80 fires across Australia on Tuesday, marking an early start of the wildfire season, which experts predict to be one of the most destructive in years, blaming hotter and drier conditions in the south of the country. And let's end this tour of the world on Punta Bonita Beach in Colombia, where hundreds of turtles were seen raging for the, racing for the ocean after they were released from a sanctuary center. They belong to two endangered species, the olive ridley and black wood turtles, and have been protected thanks to a preservation program which monitors their eggs for a month and a half until they hatch. Only then they are released back to their habitat. And by the look of it, they can't wait to go back to it slowly, but surely. Oh.
Welcome back. Time for our weekly medical checkup. This week, we're going to take a closer look at what it means to be angry and how the emotion can actually help you achieve your goals. Plus, the benefits of intermittent fasting and how it can be helpful for people with type 2 diabetes. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel joins us to discuss these latest health headlines that you might have missed. Dr. Patel, always wonderful to have you. All right, so let's start on anger, strong emotion. It's new research showing it can also be a powerful motivator, maybe not a surprise, but walk us through the new information and a healthy way to keep that in check. Yeah, Savannah Joe, this is a study that I think was very telling from the quote it opened with, the Malcolm X quote. It said, usually when people are sad, they don't do anything. They just cry over their condition. But when they get angry, they bring about change. That's really what researchers set to find out when they studied thousands of students and gave them about six different scenarios and asked them, evoked anger through certain scenarios to try to get them to do everything from trying to win a video game, signing a petition, or even urging them to vote in a situation that might be contentious. And what they found out was somewhat surprising, but maybe not surprising to people who are also thinking about times when they've been angry. They basically found out that where there were challenging situations, like a really challenging video game, or something where their financial stress was really at stake and they needed to do something about it, that having that degree of anger could actually motivate you and could actually change the outcome. So here, this is something that I think might surprise people, but the doctor's orders are really all emotions can be useful. We tend to focus on the positive ones, but here we're reminded that sometimes anger or some things that are perceived as negative can be actually helpful. But in addition to that, check your negative emotions. I think what we want to caution ourselves from is letting the anger kind of invade everything and kind of flood our judgment. So the key is really using it to motivate you, but not letting overwhelm all your other emotions as well. That is such great advice. I think anger is a thing we all try to suppress so much right. that it becomes a negative right. thing. But if you can use it in a positive way, Hell that's yeah. good to hear. Let's right. talk about diet. A new study found simply swapping certain things you eat can benefit yourself and the environment. Makes sense. What types of changes yeah. are the most beneficial? Yeah. So look, I, I am. we've been talking about swap for a long time. I'm a big believer that you can't make these huge changes overnight and that swaps are somehow kind of a way of not only tricking your mind and body, but getting a habit in place. And maybe some viewers are wondering, why would you think about swapping any sort of meats with plant-based food? And it's because these small changes can add up that in studies that they looked at, that even when you just did a small swap, think taking beef and switching it out for chicken and think like taking milk, cow's milk, and switching it out for a plant-based milk that's like an almond milk or an oat milk, something like that, any of those can actually improve your diet quality by up to 10% and reduce your carbon footprint by 35%. Just in case you're wondering, why does that change your carbon footprint? It's because nitrous oxide, which is something that meat and egg and dairy industries are big producers of, actually trap a lot of what we look for in the ozone layer and that trapping is what causes that carbon footprint changing. So people might wonder, how do these things make kind of one change for the climate? That's how you do it. So the doctor's orders here, try to do, plants are the new black. If orange was the new black several years ago, plants are the new black. And those small changes can add up. Those swaps matter. Those little things, even when you start as a kid, can actually be an incredible footprint change over your whole life. All right, pretty cool. All right, let's also talk intermittent fasting. So this is an oh, increasingly yeah. popular diet trend. I feel like there's a lot of information on both sides. Is it good? Is it bad? But a new study found that it can be helpful for people with type 2 diabetes. How does it work? How much fasting are we talking about? And should anyone consider this? Yeah, so look, this was a small study, so I want to caution this. But look, I'm going to be honest. I've even tried this myself. Some days mm -hmm. I do, do kind of what we call time-restricted eating just because let, let's be honest, if you try to kind of think about eating it all day long, it makes you just eat a little bit more. So this is really either called intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating. It took about two dozen diabetic patients, all adults, and put them into different categories. They did nothing and just let them manage their diabetes as is. For some, they restricted their calories, but let them eat whenever they wanted to. And then for others, they did what we would call intermittent fasting. They let them eat during an eight-hour window. And that's a little bit of the magic here, Savannah and Joe. It's that eight-hour window. So that means 16 hours where you're not eating. You can drink water. And there are some liquids like black coffee with nothing else in it that you could drink or tea. But other than that, it is pretty much no food during that time period. And maybe this might shock a lot of people. We all have been taught to think you just restrict the calories. But it might matter for some people, especially for these diabetics, 
that when you eat matters. And people basically in that eight hour time period lost more weight than people who restricted mm. their overall calories. Mm. So I think the doctor's orders here, it's not necessarily that simple because this does not apply to everybody. But for some, fasting to feast during that window, especially if you can tighten it down to about eight hours of eating, can be the success in weight loss. And the reason I say it's not for everyone, don't overdo it. And interestingly enough, in these diabetics, it didn't change the control of their diabetes. So the weight loss did not correlate necessarily to changes in the measurements that we use to check on diabetes control. So that's why I say not for everyone, but I personally think that if you haven't thought about trying intermittent fasting, right. and it's something that you wanna to do to lose weight, it's worth giving it a try and talking Definitely. it over with your doctor. Especially if it's hard for you to stick to certain rules for your food like it is for exactly. me other than that time That's window. Right. Dr. Patel, great That's to see right. you. Thank you so much. We're back with a closer look at the state of America's economy. The Federal Reserve is expected to issue its latest decision on interest rates this afternoon. And while many economists are predicting rates to remain unchanged, what does that mean when it comes to taming inflation? And also, of course, the holiday shopping season's right around the corner. More on what to expect. We're joined by Investopedia Editor-in-Chief and Fed Clock Man, yeah, what <laughs> is always it? Gives Just us give the it to us. Down. Caleb give Silver it to us. <laughs> is here with more of that. It's easy today, right? It's, it's, it's easy. It's, it's December 12th and 13th. That's yeah. about 30 days and 20 hours from now. So we'll keep an eye on it. We'll get the next one. All right, already. So we in the last year and a half, we saw a bunch of hikes. Now, more recently, we've seen pauses. We can probably expect more of that today, right? Yeah, the Fed's not likely to raise rates. It's going to render its decision at 2 p.m., today, but words matter. So we're going to be listening very closely to what Fed Chair Powell has to say. Are his words dovish, a little bit softer on the economy, or are they hawkish? And he may leave the door open, or the Fed may leave the door open for yet another rate hike come the middle of December. Why? Because inflation is still high, and the Fed is still trying to bring this down to closer to 2.5%. What do you think that means we're going to glean from his comments just generally about the state of the economy and for people at home to keep in mind? He's going to tell us what we know, which is consumer spending remains strong, even though we're spending ourselves into record high credit card debt. The hiring market, the labor market remains strong. They've been trying to cool that down. And there's still a lot of borrowing going on out there, despite the fact that all these rate hikes have pushed that 30-year fixed rate up uh, into about 8%. They've pushed car loans up up to about 7%, and APRs on credit cards, the median is around 24%. Those are super high borrowing rates, but they have not slowed down spending or hiring. As I'm sure you know, overnight Mariah Carey informed us the holiday <laughs> season is upon us. Some people though, have already started. I mean, they're holiday <laughs> shopping. I mean, what type of holiday season are we in store for? How is inflation going to factor in, do we think? Yeah, we're expecting sales to go back to pre-pandemic levels. So we're going to see about a 5% bump from last year. The National Retail Federation estimating we'll spend around 800, 900 bucks per person on average. Not everyone's going to spend that, but on average. Why? Because we love spending. They're already setting up the lights outside, guys, November 1st. <laughs> and it is holiday shopping no. season in full Woo! effect already. So Americans are expected to keep spending despite that record high credit card debt. I did not know where you were going with the Mariah Carey <laughs> question to Caleb. Me neither. Uh, very quickly, real estate market, you mentioned how high that mortgage rate is. What should you keep in mind? I mean, if you're in the market for a home, what do you need to know? You need to know that you're going to be paying about an 8% or higher mortgage if you have great credit. And prices are now at a record high. We looked at the uh, Case-Shiller Index from across the country. Record highs up 5% from last year. Why? Supply is super tight right now. Nobody's selling that has a lower mortgage rate than 8%. And it's really hard to get a home if you're trying to buy that first home at mess. those rates, at those prices. All right. Caleb Silver, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, let's get you more financial headlines. The National Association of Realtors has been ordered to pay a big time after a major antitrust verdict. CNBC Savannah Hanau has that in other money news. Savannah, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Savannah. Yes, so a federal jury has found the National Association of Realtors and Large Residential Brokerages liable for about $1.8 billion in damages. They found the group conspire to keep commissions on home sales artificially high. The verdict is the first in two major antitrust lawsuits targeting the longtime industry practice, seeking to drive down commissions and change the way agents are paid. Under antitrust rules, the judge could triple the damages to more than $5 billion. Elon Musk says Tesla is aiming to produce 200,000 Cybertrucks per year. The company had previously said it could make more than 125,000 of the electric pickup trucks. Deliveries will start on November 30th. And on Joe Rogan's podcast yesterday, Musk repeated how hard it is to make the Cybertruck, saying manufacturing is much more difficult than the initial design. 
end, your food may get cold if you don't tip your DoorDash delivery person. The service has added a pop-up in the app warning orders with no tip included may take longer to get delivered. The Verge confirming if you enter zero in the tip amount, an alert appears with that warning. Now, the move may be an effort by DoorDash to show customers drivers could prioritize more profitable work. Now, a DoorDash spokesperson says the alert is something the company is testing to create the best experience for all members of the community, guys. Mm, interesting. All right, Savannah, thank you so much. Yeah, We're back with good news for all you Lego enthusiasts out there. Prepare for a new challenge. The company just unveiled a massive natural history museum set that has been highly requested by many longtime Lego fans. It'll claim the title of the largest modular set in terms of piece count coming in at a whopping 4,000 pieces. It's brimming with true-to-life details featuring dual atriums, a detachable roof, and an intermediate floor. The set will go on sale December 1st for a cool 300 bucks. I'm just going to walk by the real one in my neighborhood. I, but I think that'll be fun for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very cool. I haven't done Legos in a minute. All right. Thanks, Joe. Well, finally, this hour, we want to introduce you to a family in Ohio doing something special for their son and inspiring others in the process. They've even caught the attention of one of their son's favorite athletes. NBC News correspondent Aaron Gilchrist has that story. This Halloween, Blake Mumfer is riding in style. The Columbia Blue Jackets fan coasting through the streets of Ohio on his very own homemade Zamboni. Jackets on the power play. The 10-year-old was born with spina bifida, a neurological disorder that affects the spinal cord and requires him to use a wheelchair. So, year after year, the family creates their own one-of-a-kind Halloween costumes that work with his wheelchair. Our goal is to make sure that Blake just feels like any other kid. Those creations going viral and have included a school bus, macaroni and cheese, a local meteorologist, and a box of French fries, just to name a few. It's all up to Blake. He decides every year. And he's got pretty eclectic taste. So usually we'll try and whittle it down to some of his favorite things that we can make um, as a costume on his wheelchair. For this year, the choice to make a hockey-themed costume was an easy one. He started getting really into just one player in particular, uh, Boone Jenner, he's the captain. Um, just really always said he wanted to meet him and that he's his favorite and he'd always point him out on TV. So it just kind of took off. Like he just, he wants everything Blue Jackets. Well, how's their song go when they score? Wah uh oh boom, wah uh oh Blake's dedication getting him the VIP treatment with the Blue Jackets, including a ride on the real Zamboni during a recent game, and the visit to the Blue Jackets locker room, What's up, Blake? where he finally got that dream meeting with Boone Jenner, who gave Blake his stick from the game. It's got to be the best costume here tonight. When there's about five minutes left or so, uh, we were taken down to a room and we told him there was another surprise. Um, and he just, what, what, you know, just trying to kind of figure it out. And, um, he didn't know until Boone Jenner walked into the room um, and his face was just in shock and awe and it was pretty great. Blake even leaving the arena with some new writing on his ride. Wow. And a memory for this special Halloween that he will not forget. Oh, our thanks to Aaron Gilchrist for that story. What a sweet one and incredible parents. Yeah, I love to see it and love to see the reaction from yeah. the team there. All right, that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Stay with us. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, a new phase in the Israel-Hamas war. The first evacuations of some of those still trapped in the Gaza Strip beginning just hours ago. It comes as Israel faces fresh scrutiny over an airstrike on a densely populated refugee camp. Local health officials say dozens of civilians were killed. Israeli officials say the attack killed a senior Hamas commander. We are covering it all. Also this morning, it's all in the family. Some of former President Trump's adult children, Eric, Don Jr., and Ivanka, set to take the stand in his civil fraud trial starting today and over the next few days. But we could hear from them here in New York and how it could affect a final verdict. A chilly start to November, 80 million people are waking up to frost or freeze alerts after a scary cold Halloween night. It's all thanks to a ghoulish Arctic blast that's sweeping across most of America. We've got more on when this cold spell 
could end. Plus, the creators of Friends remembering Matthew Perry, their exclusive conversation with our colleagues at Today as they break their silence on the actor's sudden and tragic passing. Good to have you with us on this busy, busy Wednesday morning. Mm -hmm. We're going to begin this hour with the Israel-Hamas war. Foreign and dual nationals are being allowed to leave Gaza along with some injured Palestinians after the Rafah border crossing with Egypt was opened. The development comes amid growing anger over yesterday's Israeli bombing of the Jabalia refugee camp in Gaza. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel has the latest. Dozens of injured Palestinians are crossing into Egypt, along with hundreds of foreign passport holders, including Americans. It is a slow process, but nonetheless, a diplomatic breakthrough. Ambulances went through the Rafah border crossing this morning between Gaza and Egypt after a long-awaited deal to evacuate some sick and injured for treatment. It's being described as a first stage and that more will follow. It comes as anger is growing after an Israeli strike devastated part of a refugee camp on the edge of Gaza City in northern Gaza. Israel said it carried out a significant strike that killed a senior Hamas leader involved in the October 7th massacre of 1,400 Israelis. In Gaza, they're calling this a massacre too. And amid the anguish are cries against the United States, which, like Israel, is rejecting calls for a ceasefire saying it would benefit Hamas. A nearby Hamas-run hospital says dozens were killed and hundreds wounded. NBC News cannot independently verify those numbers. Shortly after the attack, most communications in Gaza were shut down. A blackout for the second time in this conflict. Israel says it's targeting Hamas leaders and that Israeli troops are now fighting deep within the Gaza Strip in street-to-street -street battles with Hamas militants and taking casualties. The Israeli military says at least 11 soldiers have been killed so far. Prime Minister Netanyahu this morning saying, our soldiers have fallen in the most just of wars, the war for our home. The fighting is also dangerous for the some 240 Israeli hostages, including dozens of children taken by Hamas and held at least sometimes in Hamas's tunnels. One hostage is now back with her family, Private Ori Magidish, rescued by Israeli troops. While Natalie Ranan, an American teenager taken hostage by Hamas, is also back home in the Chicago area. She was freed 12 days ago. Along with these efforts to get some injured and foreign passport holders out of Gaza, there are now renewed efforts to get aid into the Gaza Strip. All right, Richard, thank you so much. Well, FBI Director Christopher Wray has warned that Hamas's violent actions in Israel could inspire new threats right here in the U.S. Wray testified before a Senate hearing on homeland security, warning that in just the last few weeks, several foreign terrorist organizations had called for attacks against Americans. Wray said the FBI has, quote, multiple ongoing investigations into Hamas and its affiliates, assuring lawmakers that protection from terrorism is his number one priority. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk has the details. The FBI director says Hamas's attack on Israel is inspiring the most significant terror threat to the U.S. since the rise of ISIS nearly a decade ago, while also urging all Americans to remain vigilant. It comes as the FBI says it has a suspect in connection with the violent threats made online against Jews at Cornell University. The suspect, a student himself. As Israel's war against Hamas rages on, a dire warning from FBI Director Christopher Wray. The ongoing war in the Middle East has raised the threat of an attack against Americans in the United States to a whole nother level. Ray telling the Senate Homeland Security Committee the FBI is concerned violent extremists will be inspired by Hamas and other foreign terrorist groups to attack Americans. We assess that the actions of Hamas and its allies will serve as an inspiration, the likes of which we haven't seen since ISIS launched its so-called caliphate several years ago. It comes as this morning the FBI says it now has a suspect in custody in connection with violent online threats targeting Jewish students at Cornell University. According to prosecutors, 21-year-old Patrick Dye, a junior at the Ivy League school, is facing federal charges for a series of posts, allegedly threatening to kill Jewish people at the college and shoot up a campus building. 
The Anti-Defamation League says it's seen a nearly 400 percent increase in reported anti-Semitic incidents compared to the same period last year, with college students frequently targeted. When we are hearing from students who are saying that they are being harassed, uh, concerned about being visibly Jewish, I think is really concerning. On Tuesday, FBI Director Ray highlighted the alarming surge in anti-Semitic hate nationwide. This is a threat that is uh, reaching in some ways sort of historic levels. All part of his warning that threats against both American Jews and Muslims are growing, inflamed since the war began, including the killing of a six-year-old Palestinian-American child in Illinois, allegedly at the hands of his family's landlord. Ray said the FBI also arrested a man in Houston who was studying how to build bombs and posted online about his support for killing Jews. Elected officials are facing threats as well. A Las Vegas man has been charged with threatening to kill Nevada Senator Jackie Rosen, who is Jewish, after leaving a series of anti-Semitic voicemails. His lawyer did not respond to an NBC News request for comment. As for the Cornell suspect, his first court appearance is set for today. Officials at the university say they're grateful to the FBI for, quote, working so swiftly to identify and apprehend him. Back to you. All right, Stephanie, thank you so much. Here in New York, three of former President Trump's adult children are set to begin testifying today. It's part of that $250 million civil fraud trial brought by the state attorney general. Don Jr. and Eric Trump are accused of participating in a scheme to grossly inflate the value of their company's business assets to their advantage. Ivanka Trump was previously removed from the suit as a defendant. Trump and his family have denied any wrongdoing. MSNBC anchor Lindsay Reiser joins us now from outside of the courthouse in lower Manhattan with a pre you. Lindsay, good morning. So this trial expected to last another six weeks or so. This is now the first opportunity we'll, we'll hear Trump's family directly on the stand. First up, we expect to hear from Donald Trump Jr. So what should we know about his testimony today? Yeah, really an explosive week here in downtown Manhattan when we are hearing for the first time from the former president's adult children, two of them this week. And first up, as you mentioned, is Don Jr. And we can expect to hear testimony in the AG's office bringing into evidence documents that Don Jr. himself signed based on his role with the Trump organization. Remember, the attorney general's office is accusing Trump and his family members and other members named in the suit, including former CFO Alan Weisselberg, of inflating assets to get benefits like better loan conditions they wouldn't have otherwise gotten. And so we can expect Don Jr. to be testifying to those documents. Is this your signature? But we can also expect him to try and deflect some of that blame to other members of the Trump organization, like accountants who may have had more knowledge, according to him, of some of these assets. And that was the, the information he was relying on. For example, in video deposition testimony uh, that the AG uh, will use, uh, he basically said his knowledge of uh, GAP, general accepting accounting principles, or what he learned in Accounting 101 at Wharton, and basically laughed when he said what he knows about it is that they're generally accepted. Uh, we can we can expect to hear some of that and, and again hear uh, how he, he's essentially saying that he did not have to rely on GAP as part of his work duties. Joan Spana. Lindsay, uh, just a quick recap so far in this trial. We have heard from Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, also the former CFO of the Trump organization, Alan Weisselberg. And then, of course, expecting to hear from those children starting today. The state is, though, expected to call the former president himself to the stand as we were discussing. What information is the attorney general looking to learn from Trump himself? No, we can expect more of those statements of financial condition brought into evidence. And remember, Michael Cohen's testimony was that essentially Trump had directed him in Weisselberg, although he didn't say it explicitly. Cohen testified that Trump talks like a mob boss and asks you without directly asking you to inflate the assets. Essentially, this is what I want my net worth to be. And he and Weisselberg were charged with reverse engineering those asset classes to get to that net worth. Now, we also know, though, that Trump's team tried to paint Cohen as an unreal reliable witness. They showed TV interviews in which he boasted about uh, Trump's net worth. We can also anticipate um, th that Trump will uh, uh, again try and, and, and name Cohen as an unreliable witness that he's lied in the past. And we also heard from Trump overnight on True Social, Social and he was calling Cohen a sleazebag attorney, essentially saying this is the state's so-called star witness. He also wrote on Truth Social, leave my children alone in Goron, referring to the judge, Joan Savannah. Lindsay, let's talk about the gag order that was imposed by the judge in this case, which has come into play a couple times here. Could that at all play into the former president's testimony? Well, the tr Trump has so far uh, been fined 
twice to the tune of $15,000 for violating this partial gag order. This is a gag order that the judge put in place uh, against uh, Trump saying anything about members of his staff. So originally, Trump had posted something on Truth Social about one of the judge's staff members and floating a conspiracy theory. And so the judge imposed this. He has found that Trump has violated this twice. And so he has threatened other sanctions, more serious sanctions against Trump, including even possible imprisonment. Uh, and so we will be watching, of course, on his Truth Social pages and also throughout the week to see if the former president does show up. We know that he has been addressing the cameras going in and out mm -hmm. of the courtroom, essentially trying to also try this case in the court of public opinion, Joe and Savannah. All right. Lindsay Reiser, no, keep an eye on it. Thank you Thank so you. much. A commercial pilot has been indicted for allegedly threatening to shoot the captain during flight. The altercation between the co-pilot and the plane's captain came after a disagreement over whether to divert the flight for a passenger's medical event. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello joins us now with more on this story. So, Tom, walk us through what we know about this incident. Uh, when did it happen? And tell us more about the charges the pilot's facing. Yeah, hey, Joe, good morning. So this happened a year ago, but the pilot involved has just now been indicted. The Department of Transportation's inspector general says the pilot, who worked for Delta Airlines and is identified as James Dunn, allegedly threatened to shoot the captain multiple times if he diverted the plane for a passenger's medical emergency. Dunn is now charged with one count of interfering with a flight crew. The indictment reads he used a dangerous weapon in assaulting and intimidating the crew member. The inspector general says Dunn was authorized to carry a firearm through the TSA's <laughs> Federal Flight Deck Officer Program. The IG does not say which flight was involved, nor whether the plane went on and made that medical emergency landing. The TSA says Don has since been removed from that Federal Flight Deck Program, and Delta says it is refraining from comment right now on the matter, but will confirm this first officer is no longer employed by Delta. Joe? Tom, this isn't the only pilot-related incident you've been following recently. You brought us the story of that off-duty Alaska air pilot accused of trying yeah. to shut off the plane's engines mid-flight. Any new developments there? Yeah, we do expect him in court uh, today. Just a reminder, this is an, an off-duty Alaska Airlines pilot who was riding in the cockpit jump seat, accused of trying to shut down the engines of that Horizon Airlines passenger plane. Uh, Joseph Emerson pleaded not guilty in an Oregon courtroom last week to the state charges against him. 83 counts of attempted murder, another 83 for reckless endangerment, and he's also facing a federal crime of interfering with a flight crew. Emerson allegedly told police he was suffering from a mental health emergency and had consumed psychedelic mushrooms 48 hours before the flight. Again, he's scheduled to make another court appearance today in Oregon. Joe, his attorney says at the time that he took the flight, he did not have any intoxicants in his system. His words. All right. Tom Costello, Tom, thank you so much. Well, winter might technically be weeks away, but the weather outside is frightful for millions of Americans this morning who are waking up to snow, ice, and freezing cold temperatures. And these freezing temperatures wreaked havoc on Halloween for some, forcing many trick-or-treaters to bundle up. <laughs> NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins us from Chicago with more on that. Maggie, good morning. Mm. Hey, Joe, Savannah, good morning. Yeah, look at this. I mean, this is like a serious winter wonderland. And as you point out, it is November 1st. I mean, what is going on? We have several weeks of fall left. We also have our thermometer back out for the snowy season once again. You can see it's still below 30 degrees here in Chicago this morning. And as you point out, this sudden cold snap is throwing tens of millions of Americans for a loop. We talked to people here in Chicago who say it was just a few days ago they were taking like a decently warm, sunny walk along Lake Michigan. And now they're getting hit with this early taste of winter. This morning, old man winter is clocking in early, slamming tens of millions of Americans with a brutal Arctic blast in the heart of fall. How did it hit you? Uh, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm not ready. ready. <laughs> I'm not ready. I'm ready. Not ready. No, not at all. Yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> a rush of cold Canadian air sending temps plummeting across the south and east coast. The startling drop as much as 25 degrees below the average, which could shatter as many as two dozen record lows this morning. This after, snow slammed the Midwest and Great Lakes Tuesday. In Rochester, slick conditions sending drivers off the road. Heavy snow pummeling Cleveland and slowing traffic on a major highway. South of Chicago, more than a dozen cars were involved in a pileup crash, while in the Windy City, snow blanketing streets within minutes, even catching us off guard. This just really picked up, like, out of nowhere in the middle of downtown. This is crazy. 
The stakes high, of course, for Halloween. Mother Nature forcing countless trick-or-treaters to layer up their costumes with coats and hats, including this taco. I love food. A gremlin and even a lemonade vendor. The call of candy pushing them to power through. Is it warm or cold outside? Um, snowy. We cannot believe it's snowing on Halloween. What a trip. But the spirit of the holiday living on despite the bone-chilling cold snap that's got millions checking their calendars twice. I think it's sweet and it's getting me in the Christmas mode to tell Absolutely. you the truth. I yeah. love it. It's getting you in the Christmas it mode. It is even though it's Halloween way. today, but it's I'm loving it. I'm sorry, that kid dressed as a taco really stole the show for me. <laughs> uh, a really quick reminder for drivers because, guys, it's been a while. Obviously, temperatures this cold can wreak havoc on, of all things, your car's battery. It can make it tougher to start your car if the battery's weak. So this early cold snap is a good reminder to get your car battery checked because, again, we have more than a month left until winter despite appearances. Got to send it back to you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I like that, that positive spin. It's a Christmas vibe. Maggie, <laughs> thanks so much. All right, more weather now. The Pacific Northwest is in for some heavy rainfall, which could lead to a high risk of flooding. Let's get a closer look at your morning news now weather forecast. Which means Angie Lastman's here. Hey, Angie. Hey there, guys. I, too, am in the Christmas spirit, and I'm going to put up my Christmas decorations yes. this weekend. And Same. I don't care what anybody says about it. Uh, we've, we've got the chilly temperatures for that, and we've also got an atmospheric river event that's bringing heavy rain, as you mentioned, to parts of the Pacific Northwest. It's going to be something that we'll have to watch for the next couple of days, not just today, but even into tomorrow. You you can see that big push of heavy rain with this system as it works on shore. This is going to bring an increased flood threat to this region. Portland, Seattle, you are included in this. Uh, and again, this is going to be heavy rain working through along with some strong winds. So heads up for that as well. By the time we get into tomorrow, we'll still see that steady kind of rain lasting even into the evening hours. But also note that we'll pick up on some, uh, some snow falling in portions of the northern Rockies. So that'll be something we watch today and tomorrow. Watch for uh, anywhere from one to three inches of rain for the more widespread areas, but localized amounts up to six inches are possible. We've got really good downpours that we're expecting moving on shore, and that's going to leave us with the potential for some of those really uh, saturated grounds. So heads up for the flooding concerns. Uh, and heads up for this, too. We've been dealing with these chilly conditions for the past couple of days. Today, we've got 80 million people under these freeze warnings. You can see it extends up into the mid-Atlantic and down through the southern plains, Texas, all the way up into portions of, of Virginia. So heads up for the chilly conditions. We're going to need that those extra layers for sure you dealt with it last night likely for trick-or-treating and this morning isn't much different we've been taking a run at a couple of records across this region harrison likely it's already tied a record we could see those temperatures drop maybe another degree or two not likely for a record in chicago but still 29 degrees for the low this morning similar story in cincinnati 30 for nashville so you get the picture places like dallas starting out the morning into the low 30s uh, not quite a record just yet but still the extra layers are going to be a must. This afternoon, some spots are going to need those layers still. The jackets, for sure, places like Cleveland, into the low 40s, just a high of 46 degrees in St. Louis today. The farther south you get, we'll see temperatures ending up into the 60s, but still, those numbers for an afternoon high in Houston, uh, way below normal for what we expect during this time of year. 15 degrees below normal uh, for those average highs in early November in Texas. By the time we get into tomorrow, uh, we'll slowly start to see that kind of temperature increase but it's not going to be drastic by any means but we will get back to those more mild fall like conditions by the time we get into the weekend thankfully st louis ends up into the mid 60s upper 60s by saturday upper 60s in um in, in the mid-atlantic as well and low 70s even for charlotte on saturday wow. now Let's talk about the weekend in the Northeast, shall we? I'm sick of people on Twitter mad uh -oh, at me uh -oh. for it's the not rain. Your fault. But look at this, guys. No rain on Ooh. Friday there. No rain Ooh. on Saturday there. It's even going to be mild. As about Sunday. Mentioned. Sunday. <laughs> Look, sunny and mild. But really, the spot that we're going to have to watch for the unsettled weather is going to be the Pacific Northwest. But for everybody that's been putting their weekend plans on hold in the Northeast, I've, I've dialed up a nice. We might finally for you. have a, a rain-free weekend. I'm, I'm, I'm judging. <laughs> Back now with the latest on the murders of four Idaho college students. This week, the FBI is returning to the scene of the crime. Investigators are gathering information to build a physical model of the home for the upcoming trial of suspect Brian Koberg. This comes nearly a year after the students were found stabbed to death inside that home. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer has the latest. 
It's been nearly a year since those murders in Idaho, but evidence is still being preserved at the home as this case moves forward. The doors of 1122 King Road have remained closed for months now. Its windows covered in plywood after four students living in the Moscow, Idaho home were stabbed to death there almost one year ago. But this week, FBI agents are once again entering the home to get more information as the prosecution prepares for suspect Brian Koberger's long-awaited trial. The University of Idaho says investigators asked to gather documentation in the home that will help them construct visual and audio exhibits and a physical model of the home. One of the reasons I think that they're trying to do this is so that they can perfectly depict to the jurors where each piece of evidence was and why the placement of that evidence would be considered important. Police say they recovered a knife sheath in the bed in which Kaylee Gonzalez and Madison Mogan were found dead on the third floor of the home. Prosecutors allege that Koberger's DNA proved to be a statistical match to DNA taken from the knife sheath. Zana Kernodal and Ethan Chapin's bodies were found in a room on the second floor of the home. One of the two surviving roommates was in her own bedroom on the second floor around the time of the murders when she told police she saw a man in black clothes and a mask walk past her. She says she stood in shock as the man walked toward the sliding glass door leading out of the house before locking herself in her bedroom. The victims' families fought to keep the house standing until the trial is over. In a statement Tuesday, the family of Kaylee Gonzalez and the father of Zana Kernodal said they were grateful the university paused its plans to demolish it. It's a huge piece of evidence. It's actually the largest piece of evidence in the trial. Experts tell us the DNA collection at that home is complete and has been preserved, so that evidence is already secure. Back to you. All right, Miguel, thank you. Well, closing arguments are expected to take place today in the trial of FTX founder Sam Bankman Fried. The fate of the former crypto billionaire will soon be in the hands of the jury after Bankman Fried spent the last few days testifying in his own defense. He faces up to life in prison if convicted of criminal fraud. Of course, he has pleaded not guilty to all charges. We are now joined by NBC News Now legal analyst Angela Senadella. Angela, good morning. Great to see you. So the defense rested its case yesterday. This was after we saw Bankman Fried take the stand himself and, of course, be cross-examined. How much do you think that ultimately helped or hurt his case? So whenever a defendant takes a stand, it's always this massive risk because the jury has to determine the credibility of that person on the stand. Now, Bakeman Freed, I think, didn't have much of a choice. He felt he had to take the stand because the three people closest to him had joined together to create this narrative that he entirely masterminded the whole operation. So he gets up there. The first day when he is just giving his defense strategy, it seems okay. But then on cross, when the prosecution goes back to his old words, takes social media posts, public statements, and shows these glaring contradictions, I think that was devastating to Sam Bakeman fried So I don't think he can recover from that. The jury has heard weeks of testimony. Now it's up to attorneys to take all that and wrap it up neatly with a bow and closing arguments. What can we expect to hear in the closing Yes, arguments? so we'll hear from the prosecution that he knowingly defrauded his clients, that he directed these subordinates, who then became cooperating witnesses for the government, to move funds around, to use customer funds in order to fund his very lavish lifestyle. Now, on the defense side, we're going to hear the opposite. We're going to hear re repetition that he created mistakes. He made errors, but he did not knowingly defraud. So that's the big difference here. The prosecution has to prove he knew what he was doing was wrong. It's not just that this implosion happened and he made mistakes, but he has to have known that he was mm. doing something illegal. Angela, no matter the outcome of this, are there any legal ramifications that we can pull away from this for the crypto industry generally? Not directly with crypto. It's really just fraud generally. Mm. However, with any industry that's new and somewhat unregulated, right. we heard his own lawyer say that Sam Bakeman fried was being targeted because this imploded. He was trying something new. So whenever you're trying something new in an industry, if you are defendant, you could possibly face consequences. All right, Angela, as always, thanks for being here. Thank you. Let's get to some international headlines. A suspect has been captured after an eight-hour-long hostage standoff in Japan. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga has the latest on that and some other international news for us. Hey, Claudio, good morning. 
Good morning, guys. That's right. On Tuesday night, the police in Japan said they arrested a suspect after an eight-hour standoff with an armed man who took two people hostage in a post office in Tokyo. Now, local police uh, said the two hostages were female postal workers in their 20s and 30s, and negotiations with the gunman continued throughout the day. Public broadcaster NHK said that shortly after one of the hostages managed to escape, later in the evening, the police stormed the building and arrested an 86-year-old man. Now let's move to the UK, where an important artificial intelligence summit starts today. Government officials and companies from around the world, including the US and China, will attend the two-day summit to debate how the technology should be regulated. The location of the summit is also significant. Bletchley Park in London, the location where in 1941 a group of code breakers cracked Germany's notorious Enigma machine. And Christmas is less than two months away and countless children around the world will start the countdown for Santa to arrive. But did you know there is a graduation school in Brazil for Father Christmases? Neither did I. Here are the Brazilian Santas celebrating their graduation. Their diplomas qualifies them as official Santas and are also given the golden key which symbolizes the beginning of the Christmas season. We don't know whether they also took driving lessons for the sleigh. But for now, they appear to prefer to uh, travel in a more comfortable <laughs> tram. <laughs> I'm sure the sleigh's easy to drive. <laughs> oh, no, it's reindeer not. for unruly. Yeah. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. We're back with more on our top story out of Gaza this morning. Some breaking news as the Rafa border between Gaza and Egypt was opened for a limited evacuation of foreign and dual nationals. Ambulances also entered Gaza to evacuate a small number of injured Palestinians to Egypt for treatment. NBC News foreign correspondent Megan Fitzgerald has the latest on this breaking story. This morning, the gates of the Rafa border crossing are open for the first time to civilians desperate to get out of Gaza. After a deal brokered with Egypt, a first batch of around 500 foreign nationals, including Americans, being led across the border. And at least 80 severely injured Palestinians are being rushed across the border and taken by ambulances to be treated at Egyptian hospitals. As devastation is growing inside Gaza after the deadly strike at a refugee camp, the Israeli military saying it killed a ringleader of the October 7th massacre by Hamas when over 1,400 Israelis were killed. A nearby Hamas-run hospital says dozens were killed and hundreds wounded. NBC News can't independently verify those numbers. Aid trucks are still entering Gaza via that southern crossing. Even though these trucks packed with life-saving aid are making their way across the border faster, the U.N. warns it's not fast enough to stave off a humanitarian crisis of epic proportion. Food and water quickly running out and fuel still not allowed to cross inside. Two more hospitals warning they will run out of gas today, putting thousands more in jeopardy of dying. A terrifying reality for millions trapped inside with no signs of the war stopping anytime soon. And guys, for the second time in the last five days, Gaza has been disconnected from the Internet, disconnecting them from the world. Guys. All right, Megan, thank you so much. Now to a major push by hundreds of churches in Florida. They're fighting back against that state's controversial restrictions on how black history is taught in public schools. NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson explains. Why is this important? for us to, to talk about black history. It sounds a lot like a middle school history class, but it's actually Bible study at New Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church in Miami, Florida. If you don't have an appreciation of what they've gone through, you'll never have an understanding of where they are now. Pastor Alfonso Jackson Jr. is one of hundreds of religious leaders across the state, now teaching black history in their churches, pushing back against controversial new standards enacted in Florida schools this year. Florida schools must now teach students about the, quote, benefit of slavery when teaching black history. When you heard about the new black history standards, what was your reaction? My initial reaction was initially of disbelief. And then it turned into anger. Then he found this online toolkit created by Social Justice Coalition Faith in Florida, filled with books, documentaries, and videos that churches can use to counter the new standards. It's up to us to be able to write our own story and to tell the truth. And that's what you feel like this is about? 
Absolutely. More than 300 churches in over 22 states have pledged to teach the material. Its creator, Rhonda Thomas, says the guide, which covers topics including from Africa to America and race, racism, and whiteness, is not about making any race feel bad, despite what some opponents of teaching this history say. No child should be taught in a way that it's hurtful or painful for them, but to dilute a whole teaching was just totally unheard of. The initiative is part of a storied history in black churches. From leading the civil rights movement, it will be a victory for democracy, to helping establish freedom schools and historically black colleges. And much like in the 1960s, non black faith leaders are also getting involved. There was a procession. Pastor Andy Oliver leads Allendale United Methodist Church in St. Petersburg, Florida, and is also teaching the Black History Toolkit to his predominantly white parishioners. When we learn African American history, we make different decisions. We don't repeat the mistakes of the past. Lessons in history that hold meaning for those in his community. I think it's good for us to be uncomfortable and, and, and to talk about things to, and, and to see things from, from different perspectives. And for others back in Miami. Faith leaders hope their teachings will resonate with state leaders too. What message do you hope this will send to the Florida Department of Education and perhaps even the governor? The black community will not be silenced. Our heritage will not be erased. Um, our struggle will not be watered down. And the truth will not be muted. Priscilla Thompson, NBC News. Well, a little known breast reconstruction procedure is giving hope to cancer patients who feel like they are out of good options. NBC News Now anchor Vicki Wynn spoke to one woman who recently had the procedure and now wants others to benefit. As a ceramic student at San Diego State, Carly Foss is used to shaping something beautiful from a lump of clay. The 25-year-old leaned on her art to stay positive through two cancer diagnoses. Foss first beat non-Hodgkin's lymphoma at 18. A few years later, she found a lump in her left breast. It turned out to be breast cancer, and she had to undergo a mastectomy. Automatically, your whole world changes, and you're like, what is going to happen? And really, it's an amputation of your body. Foss didn't want a synthetic implant, but she didn't have much body fat available for the usual natural breast reconstruction methods. I just didn't want to put something foreign inside my body that I knew does have potential risks down the line. Her doctors at the Stanford Women's Cancer Center told her there might be another way. Surgeons combined something called omentum, a layer of tissue that hangs from the stomach with regular body fat to create a breast implant out of a person's own tissue. Dr. Yung Nguyen and her team developed the procedure four years ago for a patient in a similar situation. She's very slim, she's physically active. She wants reconstruction, but she doesn't want to have any implants. So what are we gonna do? That patient was Kitty Wilde, a nurse from Central California. You were the first patient. It's been four years. How do you feel now? I'm really happy. I didn't need to be bigger in size. I just wanted to look normal and not be sad every time I looked in the mirror. I was back in my regular bras and out doing the trail and didn't miss a beat. Dr. Wynn says there are some key benefits to this procedure, shorter recovery time and smaller scars. I think we've been doing fat grafting, we've been doing implants for a long time, but the, the challenge that was posed to us was to create something that didn't exist before. And I think sometimes we have to kind of step back and take a look at the big picture to come up with a new solution to a problem. You've done almost a hundred of these. Why are you speaking out about it now? I think it's important for women to know that there is an option of reconstruction for every woman. Plastic surgeon Elizabeth Potter says innovations in this space are promising, but cautions more research is needed, especially compared to more established methods like deep flap that harvest belly fat and abdominal skin, which have been performed since the 90s. It's exciting to me that doctors are really pushing the boundaries and trying to find better options for their patients. I think that the jury is still out on whether this is going to be a viable option for the future. Another concern? Breast cancer oftentimes affects both the inside of the breast as well as the skin surrounding the breast. A big limitation of omentum reconstruction is that there's no skin at all involved. The omentum might fill the volume of the breast, 
but it doesn't solve the problem of bringing new, healthy, unradiated skin. For patients considering any kind of breast reconstruction, Dr. Potter says seek multiple opinions. Talk to patients who've gotten the procedure to learn about their experiences and ask your doctor how many similar surgeries they've performed. Foss and Wild say they have no regrets. Ever I tell people about my reconstruction, nobody has ever heard of it. And yeah, that shocks me every time. Because you had such a positive experience? Exactly. Um, and I wish, yeah, more people could experience it. Their advice? Ask questions about your options and the expected outcome long term. Tell me some of the specific questions that you feel are important to ask. Will they match? Um, what will it feel like? How it will move when I run? And it's your body that you're going to live with and you want to be as informed as possible. And Dr. Wynn says ultimately all patients should talk to their doctors, ask all sorts of questions about which breast reconstruction method is the right one for them. In the meantime, she and her colleagues plan to present their data next year. They hope to see more surgeons learning this technique. And in case you're wondering, Dr. Wynn and I are not related. We just happen to have the same last name, one that is very common in the Vietnamese community. Back to you. <laughs> all right, Vicki, great report, important stuff. Thank you so much. November is Pancreatic Cancer Month when people touched by the disease use their voices to educate others. That includes Jean Trebek. She sat down with Today Show co-host Savannah Guthrie to reflect on her beloved late husband, Jeopardy host Alex Trebek, who passed away after a nearly two-year battle with the disease. She also discussed joining forces with Katie Couric for a partnership to carry on Trebek's legacy. How did you get to know Jean, and how did this fund come about? Well, when Alex was diagnosed, I reached out to the Jeopardy team just to say, I have access to a lot of scientists and researchers and volunteering to help in any way I could. And of course, I've known Alex through the years. We co-hosted this Cherry Blossom Festival Parade in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. That was a number of years ago. And, you know, I, I loved and revered him like everyone else. So. Uh, when he lost his battle with pancreatic cancer, I reached out to Jean because having lost my husband, Jay, I really understood what it was like to lose someone you love so much and to actually watch them suffer through this disease. So we just got to be friends and I just wanted to support her in any way I could. And we started talking about Alex's legacy and how we could honor him. And that's when the idea of this fund came, came well, about. I, I have to think that Alex would just love this because he was such a learner. He was so into science. Yeah. What does it mean to you, Jean, to, to be part of this, this work in Alex's honor and to, and to Matthew and Emily, your kids? Yeah, I think we're really uh, glad to support finding a cure. This was something that Alex actually would champion. He loved a good challenge. He was very curious. He loved to know the answers, both at Jeopardy and at home. <laughs> Our thanks to Savannah Guthrie for that part of the conversation. Hope is on the horizon for pancreatic cancer. Katie and Jean say they're excited about the progress being made with blood tests and vaccine. Welcome back. It is a stressful time for home buyers. Soaring mortgage rates and nearly record high prices are causing some prospective buyers to be priced out of their dream homes. CNBC's senior climate and real estate correspondent Diana Olick has some answers on what you could do. Marta Moreno is on the hunt for a bigger home. That's really cool. But today's sky-high mortgage rates are giving her a big pause. I'm guessing you probably have a very low mortgage rate on your current mortgage, yes? Yes. Everybody's got 3%, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it makes it really difficult to, you know, uh, to purchase a home at a much higher interest rate. In just two years, mortgage rates have gone from 3% to 8%. That adds nearly $1,000 to the monthly payment on today's median-priced home. Rates are surging because the Federal Reserve is still trying to tame inflation, and the economy is still hotter than they'd like. We don't know exactly when it's going to be over, but we do hear a chorus of Fed speakers in a very notable way saying that they are restrictive and that they can wait and see what happens with the policy filtering through to the economy. High rates are colliding with record low supply of homes for sale, which real estate agents say is freezing the market well before winter hits. I think people are anxious and there's a lot of like buyer mentality of we're going to wait and see.
If you are one of those buyers, you probably want to get pre-approved for a mortgage at a high rate just in case. See if you can pool cash, maybe borrow from family to be more competitive. And be ready to move fast if and when rates drop. So for buyers today, it's a tough call. You can either get in now at a high rate and maybe get a deal on the price or wait for rates to drop, but then potentially get caught in a wave of competition and end up in a bidding war. Oof. All right, Diana, thank you very much. More financial news now. Troubled office sharing firm WeWork could be heading for bankruptcy. CNBC's Silvana Hanau is back with us with details on that and other money news. Hey, Silvana. Savannah, Joe, good morning. Yes, so WeWork could reportedly file for bankruptcy as soon as next week. Now, this would mark a stunning fall for the company that was valued at nearly $50 billion in 2019 and a black mark for its major investor, SoftBank. WeWork has been in turmoil ever since plans for an IPO imploded in 2019 after investors questioned its business model of taking long-term leases on office space and renting them for the short term. WeWork did manage managed to go public two years ago, but it has continued to lose money. Microsoft is launching Copilot today. That's its generative AI tool for businesses. Now, it's one of the most high-profile products to hit the market, and companies are brushing up on training employees and building their cases to ensure executives buy in on the tool. Copilot can do most things you may ask an administrative assistant to do, such as summarize video calls, write draft responses to emails, and transform more documents documents into PowerPoint presentations. Now, and now that Halloween is over, it is time to get into the Christmas spirit. Hilton and the Hallmark Channel are teaming up to create Christmas-themed suites at hotels in New York, Houston, and Chicago, inspired by Hallmark's Countdown to Christmas movies. At the Hilton Chicago, there's a Santa Summit Suite, which features a Santa-themed bed and cookie kit, a two-foot Christmas tree, life-size reindeer, and a hot cocoa stations. Reservation for the holiday suites will be available starting today, with stays running from November 7th to January 2nd. I wow. saw pictures, and it's really pretty. It's very, very pretty. Sign cool. me up. Welcome back. The shocking death of Friends star Matthew Perry sent ripples across Hollywood this week. Fans also across the country are paying tribute to Perry by remembering his iconic role as Chandler Bing. Today, anchor Hoda Kotb sat down with Friends co-creators Marta Kaufman and David Crane, who opened up about his legacy and his difficult life journey. Here's some of that conversation. Marta, let me just start with you. Um, I know you just spoke to Matthew two weeks ago. Will you just tell me what that conversation was like? It was great. He was happy and and chipper. He didn't seem weighed down by anything. Mm -hmm. He was in a really good place, which is why this seems so unfair. It's funny, Marta, you're saying that because others who spoke to him said the same thing. He was just playing pickleball. He was on top of his game. What did you think, Marta, when you heard the news of his passing? I was just in utter shock. Um, you know, my first impulse was to text him, mm. honestly. And then deep sadness, so much sadness. It's hard to grasp, you know, one minute he's here and happy and then Poof, and doing good in the world, really doing good in the world. David, he was quoted as saying that people would be shocked about his passing, but not surprised. Um, I thought that was a very poignant statement. How did that statement land with you, and how did you feel when you heard the news? I would say that's probably true. Given the journey he'd been on, and we were all aware of it, uh, there was always a part that was kind of bracing for something like this it is still hard to believe because he was he was such a sort of alive mm -hmm. person uh that it's hard to believe he's not here well i think the collective pain that was something that i wonder what he would think about in this moment yeah. it was like losing a friend david for people who didn't even know him do you think he had any idea the impact that he had on everyday people? I mean, given the response to the show in the last 30 years, I'm sure he did. But at the same time, I wonder, and even knowing that, how much he was able to internalize it and, and find comfort in it. 
And our thanks to Hoda for that interview. Well, finally this hour, it is November 1st, which means, sorry if you're sad about this, but spooky season is over, and now we gear up for the holidays. The queen of the season has officially defrosted. Take a look at this video posted on X. Mariah Carey busting out of her ice cube. <laughs> and from one music icon to another, we have some very exciting performances that have just been announced for this year's Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Just this morning, we heard it's confirmed Cher Yay. singing a new holiday song from her album Christmas at the parade. We're also going to hear from John Batista at the parade, Brandy as well. Of course, we're going to see all the floats, balloons we love. Cher, a big one for them. A very Sherry Christmas. Oh we wondered when we heard yeah, in you our household this. if if uh, Peter, my partner, yeah, called, yeah, it. Peter if called the, it. If the album was coming out, if Cher would be at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And how there she is. is. It's Are you? I great. feel like you, finally you're on board with me this year that today it's Christmas time. I'm, I'm feeling good about it. Yeah, I, I feel I'm, this I'm is better than our past early, years. Early holidays when I rolled my eyes. Yes. The I was going to say, when he rolled his eyes office. on my office trees <laughs> or my Christmas music or my little yelps every time bring it something on, Christmas bring it on. Because Thanksgiving's like I don't know. Yeah, three weeks away now, right? And it's just like, we got a lot going on in the world right now. Let's just take some joy we'll take when it. we can get it. All right. <laughs> That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Stay with us. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.